So the last talk in this session, I'd like to uh, bring up my great friend, Brian Kennedy, who, as you all know, is running a really important research center in, in Singapore. And let's see what he has to say. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you mostly about mouse studies today. Uh, although I want to point out that Andrea Meyer will be speaking later, my co-director for the Center for Healthy Longevity. And she'll be talking a little bit more, I think, about some of the clinical things that are happening. Um, so I wanted to start, before we get into mice, with a just general commentary. And uh, I'm not an MD, first of all. And second of all, I'm not uh, complaining about MDs. They saved my life twice. <laughs> but uh, I think that we tend to have this, this concept in the public that we need to rethink. And it comes a little bit from this Hippocratic Oath. Now, if you read this document, it's quite an a, uh, amazing document, given the time it was written. Uh, but the way it gets interpreted in the public is first do no harm. And I think this is a misleading uh, way to think about medicine uh, because in my opinion, uh, it gets then translated to, you know, if people aren't sick, we can't do anything for them. We need to wait till people get sick to start treating them. Uh, and individuals think this way too. And so they don't think about their health as much as they should until they have an emergent need to do something. And I just want to make the case that doing nothing throughout the life course is harming people. So when we think about longevity uh, and prevention, we need to think about this as a life course approach. And, and that includes education early on in life. And it's something that gets overlooked. If you take Singapore, for example, the kids are doing fantastic at STEM. They're great in science and, and math two or three years ahead. But they're also being put under a lot of stress. And there's more and more data that the health of these kids is getting worse even early in their life. And this is happening all over the world, not just in Singapore, for various reasons. And this is not setting up people for healthy longevity. And then when people get to adulthood, we need to work with them so that they have healthy lifestyles, so that they, they can uh, in, ma maximize their performance in health throughout their life. And then later on, we can think about interventions. Maybe at some point, we'll think about interventions earlier on. But at this point, I think that's the best strategy. If we're not taking care of people's health early in their life, uh, a lot of these interventions we're thinking about later are going to be much harder to institute. So um, I just want to leave you with the concept that, before I go to the mice, that, that we really need a life course approach to health and performance and healthy longevity. And uh, I don't think we're uh, in, in, in doing that well really anywhere in the world at this point. I stole this slide from Andrea, and really what this talk is about is biomarkers and interventions. And um, I'm going to speak mostly about interventions today, although we're heavily interested in biomarkers too. We have people in the lab developing different kinds of clocks, uh, and I'll just mention some of that later. Uh, but uh, we have to have these two things come together uh, if we're really going to understand which interventions are working and, and move that into human populations. And there are no shortage of potential interventions. This is an old slide now. Um, and uh, there are a 1,000 distinct drugs that have been thought about for longevity. Uh, 110 have been tested in mice. Many of them have shown some beneficial effect in mice. Uh, and so we don't have any limitation on things that might affect human longevity. And uh, I think that that's one argument, then, is that we need to be testing more and more of these in humans. And uh, you'll hear about that later today. But also, uh, we need to get better validation studies going on in mice. So the things on the, uh, I think, do I have a pointer on here or not? No, I don't. So the things on the right are things we're testing, have tested recently in our lab. Everything in green, with green letters, is something that we see health span benefits for. And I'm happy to talk about any of those uh, in the questions and answers or after my talk. Today, I'm going to focus on gemfibrozil, a little bit of urolithin A, and uh, alpha-ketoglutarate. I'm just going to touch on that. Um, I think that I want to reiterate what Aubrey said and, and that we really need to be testing single interventions and particularly combinations. And that's something we're working toward heavily in the lab. Uh, one point I want to make is that these, this paper that came, these papers that came out 10 years ago now with seven pillars of aging and uh, 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 how many was it? It was nine hallmarks and now we have 12 hallmarks. Um, I think these have been very informative for the field, allowed us to think about mechanisms driving aging. 
but I don't think they're particularly informative when we're thinking about interventions and mechanistically how they're working. And the reason is that when you look at all of these interventions, rapamycin is a good example of that, uh, and measure their effects on hallmarks of aging, what you find is that they impact all of them. And so this concept that we can take one drug to target one hallmark and then add them all together may not be the best strategy to go after combinations that extend lifespan. And as a result of that, we've gotten much more interested in trying to identify actual drug targets as a means to better understand which things to combine together. Uh, I do want to point out one intervention we haven't tested, although I was slightly involved in this project, and that's taurine. This was recently published in Science by Vijay Yadiv's lab at Columbia University. Um, and they have very, very solid data in this paper. Taurine levels go down with aging uh, pretty dramatically, and adding taurine back has a pretty robust effect on lifespan. Now, if you look on the right, you can see that, again, as I mentioned, taurine affects many or all of the hallmarks of aging. So I don't think, again, that's what that's telling us is the animal probably is younger biologically. Well, I don't think it's telling us a lot about mechanism. And so when you have a molecule like taurine, you have to go back and really try to understand what it's doing to affect longevity directly. And I think that's a challenge uh, Vijay's uh, trying to deal with right now. Um, taurine, by the way, is in a lot of your uh, energy drinks, and I think it's in Red Bull, actually. And so um, um, I've suggested he go to them to try to get more funding for the project. <laughs> um, but it's also widely used as a supplement. Um, and so our mouse protocol is a little bit different. Uh, we're starting around 20 months of age, uh, and we go to about 28 months. So we're not letting the animals go all the way to death. And I would argue that uh, survival is probably still one of the best ways to measure aging or if you're going to look at one uh, assay. However, there's a lot of advantages now to harvesting the mice. First of all, we want to engineer these mouse experiments to be more like human studies because the main reason we're doing them is to validate things that have been reported to affect aging that we can then move into human intervention studies with. Uh, and uh, survival is not a particularly easy outcome in humans to look at. Uh, so another advantage, as you've heard, is that when you can, you can harvest the mice, you can take all of the tissues, and we have an assembly line that collects pretty much all of the tissues from all of our interventions, uh, then we can go back and do much more mechanistic studies. So to look at aging, we're relying more on the frailty test by Susan Howlett, which we've had very good luck with using in the lab, and also a number of biologic clocks, including those derived from complete blood counts, uh, methylation, and other omic data. Uh, we also use uh, a range of behavioral and physiologic measures to see how the mice are behaving over time. Um, I, I want to point out, though, before I go on, that I, you know, I think that the, this is not an effort to replace or replicate the intervention testing program. The ITP program has been extremely successful and helped the field dramatically uh, move forward. Uh, and uh, it's, I'm hopeful that it continues to go on. I think it's very important for the field. We're taking a different approach. Uh, the, one of the advantages of this, though, is that it's much faster. And so we can start up to two, like, two of these a year and move more quickly. Uh, urolithin is one of the molecules, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, but we have tons of data on this now. Uh, but it's one of the molecules that I feel very good about in terms of affecting longevity. This was originally reported by, reported by Johan Ower's lab and has been studied by a number of other labs. And among things that we try to repeat, there's some things we can't repeat, some things that look have slight effects. Your lithin seems to be very robust in our hands, so I would encourage people to think about that more in their research. Uh, we have a graduate student, Stephen Raj, who's working on this, and one of the things we've done is lifespan studies in a range of different organisms now, uh, and it works pretty robustly everywhere. It's already been reported to extend lifespan in worms. Uh, we find uh, very significant effects in flies in both sexes for longevity. Uh, this has been repeated by Wilhelm Bohr's lab as well. Uh, the, the, neither of these data are published yet. Um, we see uh, pretty strong effects on longevity in killifish. Uh, one of the exciting things now in Singapore is we have a, the killifish model up and running, and we think this is a very valuable way of looking at aging. This is a, in collaboration with another investigator, Ko Tong Wei, 
Uh, and uh, you'll see on the right there that there is lifespan extension by rapamycin and also by urolithin. And I'm not going to show much me mechanistic data on urolithin today, but if you look at the western blots down at the bottom, what you'll see is that urolithin also reduces mTOR signaling. And I just want to point out that the vast majority of interventions uh, that extend lifespan in one way or another affect mTOR signaling. And so we need to, I think, keep the mTOR pathway uh, really in the forefronts of our minds when we're thinking about studying aging. Uh, we also see a reduction in frailty. So this is the frailty index starting at 18 months of age on the left. Uh, and at two different doses of urolithin, uh, we see a reduction in frailty. Uh, the mice maintain their weight much better on urolithin. And they also have better rotorod uh, func or treadmill performance function as well. So uh, there are a number of different health span parameters that are benef benefited by urolithin A. Uh, I want to, before I go on to gemfibrozil, which is the main thing I want to talk about, uh, I will also say that um, urolithin is, uh, um, we've done a lot of mechanistic studies. We think now that we have a target for urolithin that may be uh, underlying these longevity phenotypes. And so I'm not really going to spend much talk about this uh, today publicly, but if you're working on urolithin, we're happy to talk about collaboration and, and t discuss more. Uh, I also want to point out in these longevity studies, this is a recent one, uh, looking at gemfibrozil, glycine, alpha-ketoglutarate, and urolithin, all of which we see reduction in frailty. But uh, there's differences both in terms of sex and dose um, and you heard about this already, many of the longevity studies are being done at only one dose. Uh, and uh, that's really, uh, uh, we've done that in the past. I understand why it's done, but it's a kind of a shot in the dark. If you get a negative result, um, it's really difficult to say that uh, you, the, the compound does not work. It's just that that dose, it doesn't work. Also, if you get a positive result, you don't know whether that's the optimal dose. So we've tr gone to using at least two doses in our intervention studies now, which is still relatively small, although it's, uh, we're limited by resources as well. Um, and so an example um, would be uh, glycine, which reduces frailty in females and not males in our hands, uh, or urolithin, which reduces frailty in males but not females in our hands. Now, we need to repeat these again. We've got another study set up and running uh, to make sure all of this repeats. But the general uh, observations are that things are very sex specific. And that's not a surprise to people that do longevity studies. The vast majority of interventions are sex specific or at least uh, have enhanced effects in one sex over another. I still think that's a major area of research that we're not uh, focusing enough on at this point, uh, and so we need to look, do that in more detail. If you look at gemfibrozil in both doses in females, you see about a 40% reduction in frailty. Uh, we see a no number of other parameters that are, that are improved as well. Uh, and I, I want to come back to this point of instead of looking only at hallmarks being affected, we need to understand targets of drugs. And I mentioned with urolithin, we have a putative target now that could underlie a lot of the benefits we see. And gemfibrozil, uh, we went back and tried to find targets for as well, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the assay we use is a, a thermal shift assay with proteomics, and it's based on the principle that when a drug binds to a protein, it stabilizes it. it and so you can raise the temperature of an extract, and proteins that denature aggregate and fall out of the solution if the drug binds to a protein, it will keep it uh, soluble for a higher temperature, and then you can find that by proteomics. Uh, we love this approach. We've used it two or three times now, and I think it's been successful every time we used it. Uh, so more about gemfibrozil. Um, so this is a fibrate, or at least it's reported to be. Uh, it's been in the clinic for a long time. It's off patent, uh, and it's used for hypertriglyceridemia, hyperlipidemia, uh, it's been a relatively successful drug. It's still being sold by seven different companies. Uh, and this was the initial data that got people excited, or one of the key findings, uh, key studies at least, where you see a reduction in triglycerides with uh, people taking gemfibrozil and also an increase in HDL. Um, and so this drug has been on the market, as I said, a long time. And the proposed mechanism of action is that it binds to a transcription factor called PPAR alpha and dissociates that transcription factor from repressive complex in the cytoplasm, 
allows it to go to the nucleus and activate transcription. Uh, so we've been working on this for a while now. Uh, Chong He was at the Buck Institute and uh, worked as a postdoc in my lab. And Charmaine is a fantastic grad student in Singapore, just about to get her PhD, working on the project now. So this all uh, looked great. Uh, other fibrates appear to do this, by the way. And one of the things that we found is that when we tested other fibrates, unlike gemfibrazil, they did not affect lifespan. And so uh, that led us already to think that gemfibrazil might be doing something different. I should point out, I'm not going to show this today, that gemfibrazil extends lifespan in worms and in yeast and also improves health span in worms. So uh, this is another conserved longevity effector, and we now have the mouse data that I showed you. So we did the thermal shift assay, and we found a protein that might be a target uh, for Jim for Brazil, and that was PEPT1. Uh, before I talk about PEPT1, let me just say that PPAR alpha did not come out of the thermal shift assay. We see no activation of PPAR alpha targets with uh, physiologic levels of Jim for Brazil. And if you look in the literature, the binding constant for gemfibrazil and PPAR alpha is about 300 millimolar, which is something you're never going to achieve in an in vivo situation. So uh, that and a whole lot of data I'm not going to show you today has convinced us that PPAR alpha is not e even a target of gemfibrazil, much less the one that's relevant for longevity. Instead, what we find is PEPT1. And you can see on this slide that when you increase the temperature in the presence of the drug, the protein is, remains soluble and does not aggregate. So that's the basis of this assay. Um, and uh, so what is PEPT1? So this is a uh, uh, dipeptide transporter in the gut. It's expressed in enterocytes. Uh, and it accounts for about 60% of your amino acid uptake in the gut. Every, we, you do have individual amino acid transporters. And people like to think of the world as a pristine environment where your gut is has all the different 20 amino acids floating around and different amino acid trans transporters take them up. And to some extent, that's true. But the situation really is a lot messier. Uh, peptides get broken down into dipeptides and tripeptides. And you need very general transporters that can take up those amino acids uh, and absorb them and use them. And so this PEPT1 is the main one that does that. Um, and so what we found uh, through, we have data both in, in, in a whole range of different organisms that support this now, uh, but I'll show you the mouse data. We treat the mice for two weeks with gemfibrazil, remove the intestine, and use a fluorescent dipeptide to look at uptake in the intestine. And what we find on the top uh, right is that uh, if you add gemfibrazil either at a low or the high dose that I showed you that affects frailty, you can reduce uptake of dipeptides. Interestingly, the positive control for this is losartan, which is a, a the, so this dipeptide transporter is an off-target uh, for losartan as well, which might be intriguing. I think the more interesting finding, though, is that to, if you look at the animals after two weeks on gemfibrazil, you can see about a 15% reduction in essential amino acids in the muscle. And that's a significant effect. It looks small, but um, you know, if you take amino acids down by 10 or 15%, you're going to see effects of that. Now, we know that amino acid restriction can extend lifespan. And so one model for what's happening here is that we're reducing amino acid uptake. Uh, and that's mimicking the effects of amino acid restriction. So that's something we're looking into. Uh, and coming back to mTOR, gemfibrazil also affects the mTOR pathway. Because if you block amino acid uh, in, in uptake in cells, amino acids are a major activator of TORC1. And you can see that on the right. So if you look under the, on the slide, I'll try to take you through it. Under starved conditions, you have very low phosphorylation of S6 kinase, which is a target of mTOR kinase. Uh, if you add just general amino acids, you get activation of mTOR, and that's not inhibited by gemfibrazil. If you add leucine, you can get activation of mTOR, and that's also not inhibited by gemfibrazil. But if you add dipeptides, to the media, then you don't see the activation of mTOR in the presence of gemfibrazil. So this is a very, I think, clear indication of what this drug is doing in cell culture. And so this uh, led us to think a little bit about old drugs. And what we've decided to do is a project to try to make old drugs young again. And I'll tell you how we're going about that. So gemfibrazil, uh, widely used drug, PPAR alpha, in our, at least in we strongly believe that's not the target of the drug. 
Uh, instead, we found this dipeptide transporter, and we found two other targets in, in lipid metabolism that we think might underlie the hypertriglyceridemia uh, phenotypes, uh, and we're looking at that now. And so the idea is that if you have a drug, and it, even if it's been approved and used, but you don't know the targets, you haven't optimized the drug. Uh, and if you can identify the real targets of the drug, you can then test derivatives of the drug that are better adapted at hitting the individual targets. And that'll create new chemical entities that you can use for diseases or aging in the future. So we think this is, this is what we're doing for Jim Brazil. We're actually starting a company to look at this. And um, if you're interested, talk to me. I think the idea is to um, find drugs that specifically hit each of the three targets we've identified or differentially hit those targets. And there's a wide range of indications that can be explored. But that also leaves the question of how many old drugs have the wrong or unknown targets. And it's a surprising number. I would guess in a brief literature review that maybe 10 or even 20% of drugs that are approved near off patent or off patent, we don't know the real target of them. And we now have the technologies to look at that using things like SETSA much better than what, was what we could do in the 80s and 90s when a lot of these drugs were identified. And so we've, I've, decided, I've started working with Owen Phillips, who you might know because he's CEO of BrainKey, another company. Uh, and we think we can use AI to prioritize drugs that, uh, one, we don't likely know the real target of. Two, have disease indications or aging uh, links that are very interesting and have drug-like properties and good safety profiles. And so we, we actually think we can find a lot of different drugs out there that fall under this classification like Jim Fibrazil. Uh, so the broader concept is to take Jim Fibrazil derivatives as a lead program, but realize that there are a lot of other drugs that have that, strat have that problem. And if we use AI strategies, we can probably predict the ones that are mistargeted. Uh, the current technologies really help us identify the correct targets. We like longevity drugs, even if you're looking at disease, because I think that if they can affect longevity, that there's probably a higher number of disease indications they can be used for. And that derivatives of old drugs that have good safety profiles are more likely to be safe. You still have to test them, but they're somewhat de-risk when you start the experiment. So that's kind of how we're approaching this now. Uh, I want to go on and talk a little bit about uh, AKG. I'm just going to show two slides. Uh, this is something we've worked on for a long time uh, and with a company called PDL Health uh, to try to identify combinations of natural products that affect longevity. Uh, and we have a, a lot of mouse data, so including a lot that's unpublished. We think we're beginning to understand the mechanism of action with regard to aging. Um, but I want to use uh, human data just to make a point that uh, is is not being discussed a whole lot yet, and that's this is uh, people that use the product for an average of seven months, not a placebo-controlled study. And what we found is, in general, using a relatively simple biologic age methylation test, the individuals got about six years younger after seven months on the treatment. Um, now, there was no placebo, and I do believe there's a placebo effect on biologic age. If you're spending $100 a month to try to be younger, you're probably a little bit younger. Um, <laughs> Not, but this was a big effect, so hopefully it's a combination of the product and the placebo. Uh, but the, the more important point I want to make is that we saw a very uh, clear uh, relationship in who responded uh, to, to this particular intervention. And it was people that were chronologically older and also people that were biologically older than their chronologic age. And so in other words, people that are not aging particularly well are the ones that seem to respond in this intervention. And I, and I bring this up because, you know, as we go forward and start testing human interventions more, I think we're going to find a lot of uh, personalization happening. Some people will respond to some interventions, some people to others. It may be sex dependent. It may be the current state of their aging dependent. It may be how they're aging. And we really need to not just test interventions, but ultimately understand which interventions are going to work in which people. And that's something that the field is just starting to, to address, I think. So a lot of key questions out there. How do we perform human intervention studies? I didn't talk much about that today. Which interventions will work best in humans? As I said, there are a thousand of them in animal models now. Uh, how do we combine interventions? And that's something we're embarking on, especially in mice. We're doing lots of combinations coming up 
Uh, and uh, right now I will tell you that I can't predict the outcome of a combination. Uh, so uh, if we take two things that haven't been together before, put them together, they may be additive, but it, it's just as likely or even more likely that they will do nothing when put together or even counteract each other. Uh, and so that's a word of caution for those of you out there taking 10 different uh, supplements to, to live longer. I don't even know how to predict what two of them are going to do in a mouse. So you, you're on your own at this point. Um, uh, also, uh, can we do something about maximum lifespan in humans? I think that's a still an, I believe the answer is yes. But I still think it's an open question. And it's one that may uh, lead us to different kinds of interventions completely to have a dramatic effects on longevity as opposed to the ones I've been telling you about, which may impact, have modest impacts on health span and lifespan. Now, a modest impact of five years in extension in health span is still a dramatic revolution in medicine. So uh, I'm not here to argue that we shouldn't be pursuing health span as an outcome and shouldn't be testing the current interventions. I think it's critical that we do. I also think it's critical that we start thinking about some of the broader questions. Uh, for instance, what causes aging? I still think we, we uh, while many of people in the aging field would agree that some of these interventions are likely to have at least modest effects in humans, and we might be able to alter human longevity. Some people would argue exercise data already is there for that. Um, I think a lot of us uh, would still get into debates about what the actual events that are driving the aging process are, and it's critical to understand that. Which biomarkers are going to be most effective? There's a new biologic clock almost every day now. Uh, we don't know which ones are going to respond best to interventions and which interventions. Uh, should we use systemic ones, organ-specific ones, hallmark-specific ones? Uh, all open questions right now. And also, how can we best adapt preclinical animal models to predict human outcomes? You know, there's a lot of argument out there that mice are a bad model for studying humans. And I, I would like to argue, and I've been saying this for a while, and nobody's like pushed me off the stage yet, that uh, studying normal aging in mice is going to be more conserved to understand human aging than trying to create diseases in mice that they don't get in the first place. And so much of the criticism around mice is creating model, disease models in mice. I, I use Alzheimer's as an example. You make a triple transgenic mouse uh, to create a disease condition it doesn't normally get. And moreover, you do that in a four-month-old animal instead of an old animal, which are, it's old humans that are getting Alzheimer's, not four-month, or not teenagers. And then you wonder why what you learn in the mice doesn't apply to the humans. Uh, I think we need to do age-appropriate animal models of disease. But moreover, to the point, I think if we're looking at natural aging in mice, we're much more likely to learn things about natural aging in humans than we will by creating these disease models. So just my opinion on that. Um, I also want to point out that there are uh, two people here uh, from my lab, uh, graduate students, uh, Max Unfried, who's kind of unmissable. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, involved with VitaDAO as well. And he has a lot of data on lipids and aging. And if you want to talk to him about AI and lipids, uh, he'll be around, I'm sure. And also Camille Pavis, who's working on a number of different things in the lab. But one, uh, one thing he's done re recently is compiled data on mouse lifespan experiments across a wide range of different studies over the years. And his data really suggests that one of the biggest predictors of the effect size of any intervention is the lifespan of the control mice. Uh, and so it's absolutely critical that we get control mice that live uh, as long as possible, because if they're very short-lived, it becomes harder to determine whether the effect of the intervention is due to normal aging or due to uh, other things that may be suppressing problems in those mice. So if you want to talk about interpreting mouse experiments, Camille's around and uh, somewhere in the audience. Um, so with that, I just want to say we also have a Center for Reproductive Longevity. I keep thinking I'm going to show data on reproductive aging, but I haven't yet. We're very interested in looking at that, particularly ovarian aging. And we have a variety of other scientists and clinicians and also public health specialists working on this issue uh, in Singapore and Asia. And then finally, Andrea and I do this Healthy Longevity webinar in the US. I think most of you know about it by now. Uh, we're coming up on our 100th show in two months. And so um, 
uh, and they're all available on YouTube. So you can go on Thursdays at 7 Singapore time, which is very early in the morning if you're in the U.S. and watch the shows live, or you can look at YouTube afterwards. And all of the shows are available there. Many of the people in this audience have been on the show already, uh, and we're coming after other people all the time. So keep watching the show. And with that, I want to thank everyone and again point out that Andrea will be talking about uh, other things happening at the Center for Healthy Longevity later today. Thanks for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks so much, Brian. Um, yeah, so we've got time for a couple of questions. Well, we don't really have time, but we're going to have them anyway. What have we got? Over there. Uh, okay. Hi. Hello, here in the middle, uh, from NA, from yeah. you. Uh, so I really appreciate your comment that uh, you kind of disagree to, um, in a way with uh, creating very artificial animal models like all the transgenics, et cetera, and then wondering why they don't translate. My question is, um, when we do these kind of studies on very, let's say, nicely controlled, even wild, you know, normal wild type, et cetera, mice, and thinking about longevity, when we look at human population, CDC said, okay, the average onset of age-related chronic illness and decline right now in the West is about 51, and the expected lifespan is 87, 89, or whatever. So we tend to live, an average human would live about 30 years in disease, right? So, but then we are very heterogeneous people. Some people then live healthily and reach the, uh, reach the centenarian age because they've exercised and ate well and whatever, with exceptions, of course. Some were not living well, but how do we take into consideration that variability in, let's say, uh, driving your body to health optimization with diets, fasting, exercising protocol, m you know, metabolic switchings, and so on and so forth, versus a couch potato that lives gently for his life? So with these types of, of mouse studies, I can imagine we can really figure out how to do stuff for couch potatoes but can we really figure out the optimal health span optimizations? That's kind of my question. Okay, th there's a lot of questions to unpack there. Uh, first of all, I'm not against completely doing uh, disease models in mice. I think just, we just need to use caution about what they tell us. I think they, there are a number of cancer models and even the Alzheimer models have provided mechanistic information about neurodegeneration, uh, but whether drugs you find are translatable is a different question. And so uh, I, I don't want to be against using animal models or disease models. Uh, I, I just think that aging is a, a more natural way of looking at things that will correspond to humans. Um, so the question uh, was there's a lot of diversity in human behavior. Uh, and how do we recapitulate that in a mouse? And I think that is a, a huge challenge. I mean, we can't, uh, and, and you're right, the banks are probably not exercising as much as they normally would if they had the opportunity. A lot of them get obese. Although I will say that there's a wide amount, of, a lot of diversity in how the mice age. Some of them get, stay thin, other ones get obese. Some of them are dominant, some of them are, are, are more passive. Uh, and so there, there's more diversity than you would expect, I think, even in the mouse cages. Also, um, if you look at the survival curves um, of mice, there's a wide array of different survivals. So I, I think it's something we really still don't understand in the field. It doesn't matter if we're using yeast or worms or mice or flies. They don't all die at the same time. There's a lot of either stochasticity or environmental effects, even with a genetically pure theoretically pure population living in the same cages. Uh, and so uh, they're more, more diverse in how they age than we think. And one of the things we're doing to try to address this, though, is we're starting sort of an individual mouse longevity clinic. So we're going to take outbred mice, uh, let them get to one year of age, and then try to treat them all as individuals walking into a clinic to, to say, how do I live longer? And so can we develop specific interventions based on how a particular mouse is aging that gives it an enhanced effect on longevity relative to a single intervention in all the mice? Uh, I don't know if we can. I think it'll be an interesting experiment to do. Uh, but that may you know, at least address more of the genetic diversity that's not being tested in the mice right now. And I think it begins to try to address the, the trying to do precision medicine in, in longevity, at least in animal models. So yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's a challenge. 
Yeah, thank, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I just got to say, I'm, I too, I'm really excited about this mouse longevity clinic idea, and I hope that a year from now you'll be able to come and talk about it in more detail.